Welcome to this online lesson on Anglo-Saxon earldoms, local government and the legal system. The aims of this lesson are to describe key aspects of the legal system in Anglo-Saxon England, to explain the role of the earls in upholding the, the legal system, and to evaluate the extent to which the legal system was dependent on the earls. So, as you can probably tell, the earls in their earldoms were incredibly important in the government of Anglo-Saxon England. Firstly, some key terms. Cloak's compendium of annoying old-fashioned words that you need to know comprises of quite a few today, so strap in. Firstly, the house carls. These are highly trained troops that stayed with their lord. They act as a sort of bodyguard for someone like an earl. Then we've got the third, or feared. Men of Anglo-Saxon army and fleet. Every five hides, and remember a hide is 120 acres of land, every five hides provided one man for the feared. So these people are sort of part-time soldiers who are called up in an emergency. The word feared comes from the Old English for forward, in other words, the men that a hide would send forward for the army. Hundreds, a unit of land administration. It could be 100 hides of land, but actually this varied somewhat. Tithings, a group of 10 households. Geld tax, a tax on land. Originally this was to bribe the Vikings and stop them attacking, so it was called the Danegeld, but after the Viking threat had diminished somewhat, they kept it up because it was useful money for the king. Blood feuds, a revenge system based upon loyalty and honour. You might have already done something on blood feuds if you'd done my previous lesson, so if you have, you can skip this one. If not, this is where if someone um, has a family member who was killed, then the victim's family had the right to kill someone from the murderer's family, and then that went on. So there was a cycle of revenge. Your tasks then. Note down the key words and their meanings, and as a challenge, try and use your own words for those definitions. If not, you can use mine. I appreciate that some old English words can be rather different to us, even though our language comes from there. Well, pause the video while you complete that. Alright, hopefully you've got everything you need there. Let's try out some source skills and see what you can learn. The key question is this, what can you infer about the power of the king in Anglo-Saxon England? Check out the source first of all. The king and his Witan. This image is from an 11th century book of the Old Testament Bible stories. So. What's crucial here is that, although this is supposed to be an Old Testament king in the Bible, the artists at this time tended to draw things and paint things that they recognised in society around them. So the clothing and the way that they're behaving very much affects the, um, the um, or very much reflects rather, the society of the time. What we can see is the king in the middle, holding the scepter, which is a symbol of his power, and the sword, which is a symbol of his military might. Around him we can see these people in these funny cone-shaped hats, and these are the earls and members of the clergy who form the Witan, the Council of Wise Men. Consider this, if someone says that you've got a lot of wit, then you're probably quite clever, and this is where we get the word from. So the Witan, or Witanagabot, is the, count, the council of advisors to the king. So here's how your inferences work. Pick out a specific detail from the source and explain what it tells you. What can you infer from the source? Now, the more specific, the better, especially if it does give you a clue about something. An inference is where you are taking information from a source which isn't absolutely blindingly obvious and in there just, uh, just for anyone to see. So you do need to use a bit of historical knowledge to do this. Here's how you can lay out your answer. What does the source tell you? And you can say a detail from the source is, and then this tells me, and then what can you infer from the source, another detail from the source is, and this suggests. Have a go at completing that frame now and answer the question. Pause the video while you do so. Okay, let's have a look at an example inference. What does the source tell you? A detail from the source is that the king is in the center. This tells me that the king was the most important figure in the Witan. Now, there's nothing actually in the description to that source or the source itself that says that, but we just know that artists put the, the most important items in the middle. And look how everyone else is looking at the king. That does suggest that they're the most important. What can you infer from the source? Another detail from the source is the men pointing to the king. This suggests that the members of the Witan advise the king. So we're imagining that all the pointing and hand gestures are them talking to the king, and why would they be talking to him? Because they're advising him. Again, it doesn't actually say that in the source, but we can sort of work it out. So that was a quick practice at inferences.
If you need to improve your own answer, press the uh, pause and you can have a go at doing that now. All right, let's move on. What we're going to do now is we're going to see some uh, details and some examples of how the country was governed. What you're going to do is to record significant facts and describe how each group governed the country. In your own words, explain how each group helped govern and or defend England. If you don't want to hear me rabbiting on, then you can just pause the video and crack on at your own pace. However, here is our first example. The Witam was a council that would advise the king on issues of government. It was made up of the most important aristocrats of the kingdom. So aristocrats are basically posh people and landowners. This included the earls and the archbishops. It discussed 1. Possible threats from foreign powers, 2. Religious affairs, and 3. Land disputes and how to resolve them. So if someone was arguing over who owned what land, the Witan could discuss it. The king did not have to follow the Witan's advice, although it was often wise if he did. The king also decided who would be appointed to the Witan and when it was to meet. So, pause the video now and record those significant facts, describe how that group governed the country, and then in your own words explain how each group governed the country or defended England. Pause the video now. Okay, hopefully we recognise then that the Witan is really closely linked to the high levels of government. So if there is a threat of foreign invasion, the Witan would discuss and help prepare for that. Also, if the king needed advice or needed to uh, help dispense justice, then the Witan could advise on things like legal disputes and also uh, matters of the church as well. On to the next example. The Shire Reeves. The Shire Reeves, or sheriffs, were the king's local government officials, and they worked within earldoms to look after the king's interests and carry out his instructions. They had to, one, collect revenue from the king's land, two, collect the geld tax, three, collect fines from the Shire court, four, enforce and witness the law, what we mean by witness the law is actually see the law done, and five, provide men for the feared. A sixth um, uh, uh, responsibility would be to look after the roads and fortifications. Now, there weren't many roads in Anglo-Saxon England, but what few there were needed uh, maintenance. The king issued his orders to the Shire Reeves through writs. These were written instructions with a seal stamped by the king. So if a Shire Reeve turned up and said, Oi, you need to do this, and someone said, Yeah, um, who's telling you to do that? They could hold a, hand over an actual written document with a unique seal that only the king used. And that was a good way of ensuring that it wasn't a forgery. Right then, pause the video and again record any significant facts to describe how that particular group of people govern the country and then explain how they were able to help the king govern or defend the country. Okay, there's a couple of things here for the Shire Reeves. Really, the Shire Reeve, and you can see a picture of a reenactor doing it here, was a local official who was really quite important, and they had a chain of office. You can see it around this man's neck. It might remind you of, say, the chain worn by a modern mayor. Now, their, their main roles were really in the enforcement of the law, so that would help govern the country by making sure that the king's commands and laws were actually followed. But in terms of the defence of the kingdom, they're crucial in raising the army. So the Shire Reeve would turn up and ensure that every um, hundred would give forward their, man, um, their, their men for the feared. Now we've got the earldoms. Now, earldoms have been introduced by the Viking king of England called Canute. Canute is a, a weird old word, really. I mean, some people say it looks a bit rude, but I couldn't possibly comment on that. What it's related to, though, is our modern word knot. Now, if you think about tying a knot in something, that starts with a K, isn't it? Well, originally, that's where that K was pronounced within the word knot, meaning cannot. So Canute was the king who brought people together or tied them together and united them. That's where the word comes from. So... Earldoms have been introduced by the Viking King of England called Canute after he had conquered England in 1015. Canute made his followers uh, the earls of the four great king earldoms, but he soon passed the title on to the leader of the most important family in each earldom. For example, Canute made Godwin Earl of Wessex in, ten, ten, in the 1030s. Godwin was an Anglo-Saxon, and he was a man that Canute could trust and to, to follow him very loyally. Just one further point, 
When we're thinking about the Witan and their advice, Canute had a very cunning way of ensuring that the Witan were honest with him. Now, Canute is probably most famous now for turning back the tide, or rather, attempting to turn back the tide and getting his feet wet. Now, much as this is often said to make him look really stupid, it's actually a very clever move. What he was doing is he was showing his Witan, or his most important nobles, that he had very little power in, in comparison to God, and so that they should be honest with him so that he didn't make mistakes, as he wasn't infallible. So this whole, I command the tide not to come in, was him saying, well, actually, I can't do that. God is in charge of that, so you make sure that you give me good advice. Clever guy. Anyway, I'm getting off the point now, so pause the video, make some notes on how the, uh, the earldoms were governed, and what role they had in defending and governing England. Pause the video now. So the earldoms, they're probably the most important um, factor in terms of the government of big areas of England. We can see some examples of the earldoms on the map there. So this is more about the government of England and the enforcement of the law and making sure that the main landowners and earls were really loyal to the king. Lastly then, we're going to have a look at the feared. So this is the main army that's called up in emergencies. When the call came from the king, each group of five hides was obliged to provide one man for the feared, together with his battle equipment. The select feared gathered men to fight anywhere in England for the king, and the general feared gathered men to fight who did not travel outside their local area. The select feared were made up of thanes and their followers, rather than the general people. They could not stay away from home too long as their farms would suffer, especially at harvest time. Therefore, a period of 40 days was fixed for service when called after which they would be disbanded and they could go home back to their farms. Remember that the year at this time was very much dictated by the farming calendar. So in other words, when you sowed your crops and when you um, saw them grow, when you harvested them and when you ploughed your land and so forth. Pause the video now while you complete your notes on the feared. Hopefully we've recognised then that the feared is very much a big part of the defence of England. So an army of men that can be called up in times of emergency, either to serve anywhere in England or indeed within a specific local area to guard it. We're now going to have a more detailed look at the Anglo-Saxon earldoms. There they are in the map. You'll notice that many of these uh, terms are still familiar today. Although the system of earldoms has declined, these regions are still very much called this in modern England in most respects. For example, the area north of the River Humber is Northumbria. Mercia is still the Midlands. Indeed, the Midlands Police is called Mercia Police, like West Mercia Police. And then we've got East Anglia. This includes uh, counties such as Essex or the East Saxons. Then we've got Kent. Kent is still called Kent, but actually the region shown on the map also includes places like Sussex or the South Saxons, and then Wessex or the West Saxons. Notice that Scotland is its own country off to the north. Wales is still uh, very much a foreign country at this time, and indeed the word Wales relates to the Old English for foreigners, so they were very much ruling themselves and having their own society, and similarly for the Cornish as well. That's why the Cornish language still basically exists. So on your own copy of the map, and you can find a link to a suitable map in the description, or you could draw your own, add the following labels. First of all, give it the title, Saxon Earldoms, in around 1060. Then add the names of the earldoms. Uh, one word of advice, when you're writing down Kent, I'd also note down Sussex. Then add who ruled each earldom. Wessex, Kent and Sussex were all ruled by Harold Godwinson. Leofwine and Gareth Godwinson were in charge of East Anglia, although it should be said that Leofwine was more in charge of London itself. Northumbria was ruled by Tostig Godwinson, and Mercia was ruled by Elfgar. Now, notice that the Godwin family, or the Godwinsons, are the main family in this kingdom at this time. They were the most important family after the king. Elfgar was an ally of the Godwinsons and got on very well with them. Indeed, Harold Godwinson was married to Edith, the daughter of Elfgar. One further point, Elfgar is a really cool name because it literally means Elf's Spear. Then, what I need you to add after that is a line called the Danelaw. You'll see it appear on my map now. 
The Danelaw was originally a dividing line between the Danish north, where Viking kings effectively ruled, and the south, where English kings ruled. Later, although the English united the entire kingdom, the culture of the Danes, or the Vikings, still existed very strongly in the north, where they had different laws, different customs, and even different language. All you need to do is look at some of the place names of the north of England, and some of the, the slang and local dialect that they, they still use up in the, uh, the more remote and rural areas of northern England to see this. For example, I've got a couple of cousins from Yorkshire. To them, a stream is not a stream, it's a beck. That's a Viking word. Also, the lake out the back of their house is not called a lake, which is from French. It is called a mere, which is from Viking. And so there are examples of this surviving culture. So make sure that you draw your map or select the one that I've given you in the link to the description, add those different details and have a go at memorising them. While you're doing that, you can pause the video now. Okay, so each of these different earldoms would have been ruled by an earl, helping to dispense the king's power. So we're now going to consider the strengths and powers and the limitations of powers that the earls had. Now this is going to take a little bit of time, so make sure that your video is in high definition so that the text is nice and visible. I'm going to read it to you and you can pause this at any time while you record the strengths and powers and the limitations of the earls. This might be done quite well in a mind map or in a table. In order to aid the king in governing the country, the earls were given many of the king's powers. Firstly, wealth. Earls received one third of all the money raised by taxes. They were supposed to use this wealth to ensure their earldom was well defended and well run. Though let's not kid ourselves, they made themselves fabulously rich as well. Secondly, law and order. Though the king made the laws, the earl had to make sure that the, earl was uh, that the law was obeyed and they decided who was guilty or not in their kingdom, although this task itself was often delegated to the Shire Reeve. Armies. Earls were the lords to many things, and also maintained an elite bodyguard of professional soldiers called housecarls. The king used his earls like generals. They were his military leaders against the king's enemies. So when a king was strong, as Canute was for most of his reign, the power of the earls was definitely less than that of the king. A powerful king like Canute would demand obedience and would punish those who failed him. But a king like Edward the Confessor, who was, was not so strong, he spent most of his time in exile, which means out of the country, or in prayer, and he did not have the support of hundreds of important followers in England. It seems likely that he had to depend on Earl Godwin in particular. When Edward brought no the Normans into important positions in English government, Godwin and other earls were not happy and resisted their appointments. They worked together to get Normans sent back to Normandy. Wouldn't it be awkward, for example, if, for example, uh, Edward the Confessor had promised his kingdom to, say, a Norman called William? Well, there is some suggestion that he actually did that. More on that in a future lesson. However, the earl's power relied on the support of the thanes in their earldoms. We know this because on occasions when thanes demanded that earls were removed from their positions. This happened in 1065, when Earl Tostig, the son of Godwin, lost his earldom and went into exiles after protests from his thanes about the way he governed his earldom, Northumbria. Alright, so if you haven't done so already, pause the video and make sure you get down some of the strengths and powers that the earls had and some of the limitations. Pause the video now. Well, hopefully we've noticed in terms of strengths and powers that they were wealthy, they, can, they uh, made sure that people obeyed the law, and they could raise armies. But also that when they had the confidence of the king, and when the king was strong, the earls themselves had strong powers. Further than that, even when the king was unpopular, earls could be powerful uh, in terms of enforcing the king's laws and making sure the country was well, well run. However, on the other hand, there were limitations. They didn't make the laws up themselves, or so they needed to ensure that their thanes were loyal to them, otherwise they might get kicked out, as happened in 1065. Hopefully you've got down some other details as well, but that's the basics, so let's move on. I've included this section simply because I find it really interesting. At the top we can see a photograph that I took some years ago at a place called St Gregory's Minster. It shows the Kirkdale Sundial. This is a rare example of a quite detailed, original Anglo-Saxon inscription, and we can date it really closely to within a few years. Not only that, but it's written in English, whereas most inscriptions at this time were written in Latin, especially when they were built around churches. Indeed, this one's got a couple bits of Latin in it mixed in too. 
What makes it really interesting for me, though, is it mentions the king at the time, it mentions who was the earl at the time, and all but one of the names are Danish or Viking names. And this just shows the power of the Vikings in the Dane law. So remember, they were dominant up there. So what I'd like you to do is have a look at the clearer version down there, because I have made it easier for you, and have a read of that inscription. Off you go. What do you mean you can't read it? That's in English. Okay, yep, yeah, fair enough. That is virtually impossible to read unless you're quite practised. So I'll read it to you. Ready? We'll start at the left, and then we'll go over to the right-hand panel, and then I'll read the bits in the middle. Clear so far? No, I didn't think so. All right, let's try it out. Orm Gamelson Botan Sanctus Gregorius Minster Fan Hitwasal to Brocken and to Fallen In he hic himmechen from Grunda for Christo Sanctus Gregorius in Edward Degum King in Tostig Degum Earl Howarth me rot and brand priest This is Degum Solmerca at Ilkem Tide Good any clearer no, I didn't think so, but it's a good guttural sound, the Old English, isn't it? So let's translate it into Modern English. It starts with a Danish name, Orm Gamelson. See if you can recognise that. Orm was his name and Gamelson was his surname. He was the son of a man called Gamal. Now the next bit says bot, which means bought. So he's bought it, buying something. And we can see Gregorius Minster there. Than hit was all to broken means when it was all broken. And to fallen means fallen down. And he made it new from the ground for St. Gregory and Christ in Edward Dagum King. And then lastly, in Tostig Dagum Earl. So some of the letters are a little bit different to what we'd experienced today as well. So what we can see is a man called Orm Gamelson bought St. Gregory's Minster. When it was all broken down, he made it new from the ground for Christ and St. Gregory in the days of Edward the King and in the days of Tostig the Earl. Now the bits in the middle tell us a little bit about the function of the sundial and who made it. Howarth me rot means I was made or wrought by a man called Howarth and by a man called Brand who was the priest at the church. This always makes me smile because I imagine all the year seven pupils I've had who have spent ages making a poster, then put the heading on it and realise they've run out of space. Well, this is effectively what the carver of this has done. We can see the word brand and then the word priest has had to be abbreviated and shoved just above that, that line. I bet he was kicking himself for including that cross at the start. And then what about the last inscription? Well, this is quite a simple sounding thing and it could be taken very literally, but I believe there's a deeper meaning here. This is Degum Solmerca at Ilkum Tide. I am the day's sun marker at every tide. Now a tide is like the tides coming in from the sea and they mark the day's passing. So I am the, the sun's the, or the day's sun marker at every tide. In other words, I am telling the time every single day that happens. Are you using your time wisely? That's the question that this sundial is really asking, because the belief was that Christ was going to come back onto earth. And if he did, would he be pleased with what he found? So I hope you found that interesting. If you didn't, well, tough, it's my video. But let's move on to the last task. We're going to conclude with an exam question, which will last us about six minutes. It's another one of these four mark questions that you may have tried before. They're pretty easy, as long as you take an approach that's kind of measured and you use good examples. Describe two features of earldoms in Anglo-Saxon England. Four marks. Now the exam paper will be laid out like this, with two headings and space to write your answer. You should take advantage of this. Also, here are some sentence starters to help you, but very often with these type of tasks, you won't need them. Definitely don't spend any longer than about five or six minutes on this question though. So, have a go, just choose two examples and give a little bit more detail. Pause the video while you complete the task. Okay, hopefully that wasn't too difficult, so let's have a look at an example answer. Describe two features of earldoms in Anglo-Saxon England. Feature 1. One feature of earldoms was that they were ruled by an earl. Look, I know that's obvious, but actually it would get you a mark. Earls were able to support the king by enforcing the law and collecting taxes and by raising armies. Okay, there's my extra detail, that's my second mark. Feature two. Another feature of the earldoms was that there were different earldoms in different parts of the country, which allowed the king to have authority over all of England. 
All right, so that's sufficient detail for my third mark. For example, Northumbria was, in, was north of the Danelaw and allowed the king to control the north of England, while Wessex was in the south and the king had authority there too. So, have a look at my answer, make any improvements to your own, and do bear in mind that actually for my second point in particular, I've had a little bit more detail just so that you can uh, check your own answer too. Once you've finished correcting any uh, mistakes that you made or improving the detail of your answer, then this lesson is at an end. I'll say thank you very much for watching. I hope you found it interesting and useful. And if you have, then please like this video and subscribe to the channel. I'll be back for more soon. Goodbye.